Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Program Director. <coughs> uh, I was in trouble the last two days and the last week when I published an article in my personal view and got the country running. So what I'm presenting, I'm representing the Department of Basic Education. <laughs> Just for the record. Uh, Stephen has given you some interesting figures, so I'm not going to spend time on the figures. I just want to outline to you uh, the three critical processes that I want to follow quickly. And thereafter, I think when we entertain discussions and debate, uh, I'll present my views uh, on what has been presented to you now. From the Department of Basic Education uh, point of view, there are four critical points that wants to bring to attention that determines our budget uh, processes, allocations, as well as our intervention mechanisms. Uh, one, obviously, is the constitution of the country. Uh, the constitution of the country dictates certain norms to us to say these are the things you can do. For example, you cannot turn uh, a learner away to say the school is full. <laughs> and therefore, even if we have budgeted to say in this school we are going to have 700 learners, and tomorrow morning, 150 learners prop up at the beginning of the year, uh, you are compelled to admit those learners. And that automatically affects your planning and budgeting. And therefore, the Constitution is a very, very important document. It's something that many people selectively quote when they do their budgeting presentations, and therefore miss the point that to us, it's something that dictates and something that we must respect. Within the Constitution, there's another important legislative framework called the South African Schools Act. It determines and manages how we're dealing with the issues that are related to the functioning of schools. For example, we've got uh, a system where we've got provinces. So as government, national government, we need to respond to the imperatives of the provinces. Um, a recent example would be Limpopo. Uh, government collapses there as government, provincial or national government, you can't fold your arms and say, government has collapsed in Limpopo, therefore you can't intervene. Legislation compels you to intervene. So therefore, it's very, very important that you take that into consideration as well when you deal with the resourcing of schools. Uh, that there are some, I call them uh, dictators uh, of a special type. Uh, that have got those two dictators that are dictating to us. Uh, that's the constitution and the piece of legislation I've just quoted called the South African Schools Act. But within that process, uh, we are led by a political party that makes policy pronouncements. And therefore, our budgeting and resourcing of schools is also influenced by what I call policy pronouncement. You go to a national conference, at a national conference, a political party take a decision that uh, uh, by 2014, 80% of the schools must be no fee paying schools, which means parents must not pay fees. And within that particular component, it means as a department, we have to conform to that policy pronouncement and ensure that policy pronouncement is adhered to and is given the necessary resources and support that are needed. And that's one aspect that I said. Uh, we've got a series of policy pronouncement. Um, and I don't want to bore you, but the key one is the no fee paying school policy pronouncement. And also uh, that as government, you need to phase out what we call the quintile system that Stephen has adequately compelled, uh, outlined here. And we've, we've gone on the public space to eradicate uh, the quintile system, and we're quite convinced that come 2014, uh, we'll have two forms of schooling uh, funding norms in our country, which will be a fee-paying school and non-fee-paying school. Uh, at this present moment, 81% of our schools are non-fee-paying uh, non schools, which simply means that parents are not even paying a single cent uh, for their last to get school. But it's a system that has been abused. I think we've just published some regulations to manage that aspect. The third component that I want to bring to attention that dictates to us on our funding and resourcing model is what I call social pressures. Uh, there are some social pressures that uh, you can't ignore. Uh, for example, poverty. Uh, we have no choice but to fight poverty. And therefore, it means, therefore, a learner before he sits down to get into a classroom to be taught by a teacher, that learner must be transported by government to that classroom, must be taken from a rural area to be set there. Uh, and when people compare our budgets with other worlds, those children, they come to school dropped by parents. Our children, government must take them. So it's a huge level of budget. Uh, every day without failure, we are transporting 8 million learners to our various schools in the country. 
So if we have to transport 8 million learners to our schools every day without failure, it's an indication that a huge resource mechanism goes to poverty eradication. And the other thing that related to poverty is that uh, that learner, yes, dropped to that school. You have acknowledged that is poor. What do you do during lunchtime? You must feed that learner. And therefore, we're feeding 8.2 million learners every day <laughs> in all our schools uh, as part of our poverty eradication strategy to deal with the poverty effects of society. Uh, and obviously, you'll agree with me uh, that those poverty levels are not imposed uh, or were not something that came out. There are historical imbalances that we have to take note there and accept uh, that they've given us uh, these particular uh, problems that we have. But besides the social pressure that I'm talking about of poverty and all other related matters, the issues of diseases. Um, as a department, uh, we've got a budget of almost 128 million rands to fight HIV AIDS in all our schools. Um, we take every learner before that particular learner can sit on a desk all grade ones until, until grade four. We have to check if that learner can see, can hear, and the dental and deworming of that child because that child cannot be in a position to access a clinic. So those are the social pressures that we have to deal with before you even start to deal with the real budget matters of teacher, uh, LTSM, and other materials. So you've got all these social pressures that we have to attend to and deal to. Uh, and unfortunately, as you know, uh, we as South Africans, the only good thing that came out of the uh, uh, liberation was the Nelson Mandela. Any other thing that is not related to Nelson Mandela is not a good thing. That is the poverty things and other related matters. We only need the anti-apartheid icon is Mandela, but the effects of that apartheid must be forgotten. And I always give this example that uh, you can't forget that and say it's history. Uh, it's something that you are stuck unless you underestimate the impact uh, of that social problem that you have. So besides those social effects, uh, and, and the political uh, environment that we find ourselves in, uh, we have those particular issues that we, we have to deal with. But this problem that Stephen has outlined, but uh, I want to emphasize it, that we believe in what you call labor peace, which simply means that the relationship between the department and the union, and the unions, the very, very important relationship. It's a balance that is very, very painful and difficult, but it influences our budgets, heavily so. Um, I lead the negotiations, I lead the planning, the budgeting, I develop strategies as, as, as part of the advisory team of the minister on how to deal with the unions. And majority of people have not accepted that in this political term that we're in, we've managed to tame the unions badly. Uh, they themselves have accepted, but it's already late, the term is ending there. They will see with the next minister, we're finished with them, we're going to deal with the other issues next year. And one, let's agree on the terms of of references. Let's agree on the rules of the game. And you don't change the rules of the game while the game is in motion. You deal with the issues that are there. So labor unions put pressures on the budget of the department and the resourcing of the department. Remember, it's not only about their salaries. It's about the material they utilize in the classrooms, about uh, their members' uh, 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 interest in the classroom, and many other related matters. So it's another pressure that we have to deal with as a department <coughs> if you are talking about uh, the issues that are related to budget. The last aspect, unfortunately, uh, the last two aspects, I don't want to spend more time on them. Uh, one is democracy, uh, and you've got, uh, we have to listen to organizations that we believe sometimes are pressured by other things other than the issues of education. Uh, and I'll debate with them, I always debate with them. Uh, as part of the dictates of democracy, you have to listen to pressure groups. Uh, you've got equal education, you've got section 27, you've got uh, legal resource aid, you've got many institutions. And, that determines the budget direction of the department and resourcing of the schooling of our country. And it's one aspect that we need to attend to and deal with. And the last one uh, 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 is what I called uh, international trends and international relations. We are part of BRICS, uh, we are part of um, uh, EU, we are part, so we are dictated by that relationship at that particular level, therefore, to deal with those things. So I've just outlined to you the things that influences and directs to us the budget allocation and resourcing of our schooling environment and to deal those things. Within that aspect, we have to determine as government to say what our priorities, because we can't satisfy all these things, take into consideration that we have to balance these five aspects that I've just outlined to you. So we need to determine what are the priorities. Two, we need then to take a conscious decision to say, therefore, where are we investing as a state 
in terms of education. Uh, there's a wish we can cover everything. The reality is that we can't. And therefore, I want to outline to you what I say is the state of education in the country in terms of figures, uh, so that I can outline you uh, the figures uh, uh, that we have as a government. We are talking about the 17.5 billion industry annually. Uh, that's the allocation that we get. And we intend to grow uh, more or less by five, between five uh, and seven percent. If you take into consideration the National Development Plan's targets, uh, we need to grow faster than what we are getting out of the budget. And as you say, it's very, very difficult from the department point of view to go and argue for budget because they say you get the largest portion of budget. Deal with what you have. You can't get more. Yes, government, education is a priority, but there are these limitations that we have to compete with. That is health, that's human settlement, that's many other things. So you have to deal with the issues that you have at hand. So we are talking about a 7.5 billion budget that we need to deal with. Majority of that budget goes to, as Stephen has correctly <laughs> captured it, goes to the issues of uh, salaries of, uh, of educators. But it also goes to what you call uh, uh, compelling, and that's the legislative argument that I raised earlier on. Uh, we are compelled to give budgets to provinces as well. So we are not dealing with it as a national government. It's a form of governance that uh, people say our constitution is a beautiful government, but it's own limitations in terms of cooperative governance because the minister gives you the budget as a province, but you can't, the MEC does not account to the minister, it accounts to the premier. Uh, and it's something that legislatively we can't. We give you our money, we can't follow it up. The Auditor General comes and says, but we gave you money, you have to account for it. We've passed it over to somebody. We are just a conveyor belt. Uh, you receive from national treasury, you give to provinces, but if you have to make the provinces to account, you can't, uh, purely because the province account in a different format. The premier must go to the provincial legislature to account, whereas we are expected to account at the national parliament where majority of South Africans believe that we are located, you need to account to them. So you've got 10 accounting stations. You've got nine provincial government, but you've got the national parliament. So those 10 accounting stations account differently. And we cannot be in a position to measure and deal with those things. But what is the landscape of our, as I said, in figures of our education system? This year alone, we've enrolled 12.5 million learners in our schooling environment. So we've got almost 13 million learners around the schooling environment. Uh, these are the children that we have to take care of uh, almost on a daily basis and account to them. We've got uh, 366,440, uh, almost 367,000 educators in our schooling environment. And these are the people that you need to take care of almost on a daily basis. We've got 25,000 public schools and almost 1,480 uh, private schools. So the private schooling environment in our country is very, very, it's only based in two main provinces, which is Gauteng and the Western Cape. But majority of learners in our schools are in the public education space. And that's where uh, we need to deal with the issues that we have. 83% of 16 to 18 year olds are in our schooling environment. So that captured audience, they're in our schooling environment. Uh, that, that's the number of learners that we have. Uh, that we are preparing to go and participate in the economic activity of the country. It's 83%. 99% is the seven-year-olds to 15-year-olds. So those that are young, supposed to be in the schooling environment, they are in our schooling environment. And that's an access rate that you can't compare with any other country. I'm raising these figures because you check and compare us with developing countries. They've got a slow number of learners that are captured in the schooling environment. We've got a high number of school learners that are captured in our school environment. And by definition, therefore, the allocation and the budget to those particular learners, the differences will be huge. And that's one aspect that we want to put uh, that uh, South Africans must take note when they compare us with other countries. Let's deal with the great arts, which to us is a very important aspect. Uh, the National Development Plan is dictating that uh, we must have a two-stage grade R. You know, now we have grade R, and after grade R, go to grade 1. The same must have grade R1, grade R2, and therefore grade 1. Uh, but we have almost doubled. In 2003, we had 300,000 grade R learners in our system. As I'm speaking to you now, we've got almost uh, 800,000 grade R learners. So the schooling environment from grade R to grade 12, we've managed to ensure that our learners in the schooling environment and therefore we need to give them the necessary resources that will allow us to respond to those issues. What, are, what have we prioritized? 
we have prioritized four areas. I'm responding to this because I want to push one important element that uh, is very, very important. And I'm glad that you raised the program director when you raised. It does not mean if you've got the resources, we'll be in a position to have a positive outcome. It does not mean that if you have the capacity to manage those particular resources, you cannot influence the outcome in the classroom. So that is why we've taken five critical priorities as government to say these are the areas that you are going to work on. One is teacher development. That we have to invest in teacher development and provide all the necessary resources to teacher development. It goes without saying that for us to get a positive outcome, our educators must be happy, they must be trained, and we'll be in a position to, because that's the primary mandate uh, that we need to. Uh, um. And the second then is what we call the uh, uh, learner achievement. The investment in learner achievement, which simply means that you have to have extra classes. Uh, <laughs> Uh, learners must get all the necessary things that they want for them to achieve uh, and, and provide all the necessary support uh, that you need to deal with. And the third aspect, which is something that has been, Stephen has uh, articulated, is what we call the learner teaching materials, LTSM. Uh, those are textbooks. We are one of the few countries that we give learners all the textbooks that they need. And it's something that is a thorny issue. Uh, in this particular country. The investment in it is massive. Uh, and I'm trying to rush quickly, so I will have given you figures. Uh, in Limpopo alone, when we're accused of not delivering textbooks, uh, we've delivered almost 5.4 million textbooks in that particular province. Uh, this year, we are delivering 6.2 million textbooks in Limpopo alone, so times that by nine provinces, it will give you an overall figure of the LTSM investment that we have uh, uh, in that thing. And the, the next priority area is what you call infrastructure development. Uh, ensure that all learners are in, uh, in, in, in an environment that uh, it's huge. Uh, the state gave us almost eight billion for the next three years, uh, ending next year, to eradicate what you call math schools. Uh, it's a huge amount of money uh, to deal with these things. But within that aspect, you've got lobby groups that say regulate <laughs> Uh, that every school will have water, every school will have electricity, every school must have laboratory, every school must have library. And we've got only a billion to eradicate uh, unsafe school environment. So if you take the pressures of society, as I dictated at the beginning, uh, the things that uh, dictate to our budget, we've, done, we've now published uh, 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 the norms and standards uh, to say yes, we will. It's an idea, we will not defeat that idea. <laughs> but each and every school must have, obviously, toilets. Every school must have. But the problem with norms and standards is not only say every school must have a toilet, say how many toilets they must have in that school. <laughs> if you say they must have libraries, how many books? And we are, not, we are an education institution. How many volts of electricity must be available? <laughs> so we must go and get other government departments that specializes in those things. And to put electricity in a community in terms of a school, where the community itself does not have electricity, <laughs> you just have uh, power lines coming from nowhere, going to a school and jump the community. We're opening a new school in uh, Eastern Cape last week. Uh, members of EFF stopped us. Say, no, 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 no. You can't have electricity just jump everyone, go to a school, and that's it. But that's the pressure that we have as government to say, no, give every school electricity. And when we want to put electricity to the, the community, say, no, 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 no. We need water as well. We need, so school is part of a community. You can't isolate us. You can't isolate. So you have to budget beyond the normal time that you have. There was a cartoon in the star yesterday, we have seen, where the minister was drawn to say, you say we'll do all these things only in 2030. <laughs> uh, it's because we want to do it tomorrow. But there are these pressures of society that put it very, and make it very, very difficult to deal with these issues. And the next priority is what we call curriculum uh, 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 support. We have to invest in curriculum. We have to ensure that at all times, we move with times. Uh, for the synthesis will remain for the synthesis. So it's not about uh, 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 whether it's that particular issue or not. It's just to move with times to deal with the challenges that you have. And that's the investment that you have. And we've taken a conscious decision to say, we'll then invest in what you have, workbooks. That every learner must have a workbook. Uh, we've printed this year alone, 
24 million workbooks. Uh, it's a replacement for schools that don't have textbooks and have something that will ensure that uh, uh, there is movement of education uh, in that particular classroom. So if you take all these things, the most important aspect, therefore, becomes the school infrastructure. It then becomes what you call LTSM. It comes what you teacher development and the investment uh, 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 in the workbooks. And that's what we have invested on and put all those things. And we believe that the combination, therefore, will enhance the schooling environment. So we don't believe that if we have this infrastructure, the outcome will be positive. Within that aspect, we said, let's use an educational tool that will determine where we throw the last remaining amount of money, hence the introduction of what we call the annual national assessment. Because previously, you have a say to say, these kids in this school can't read and, and, and write. Because they can't read and write, throw money into Saturday winter school training development. But now, with the annual national assessment, we can tell you which teacher is teaching, which school is performing. So you don't throw money where the problem is not there. You throw money where the problem is because you know countrywide, desktop like, you can name any school will tell you this teacher is struggling with trigonometry <laughs> or this teacher is struggling with this. So training is focused. It's not about throwing money. So that's the tool that now we are utilizing as the last aspect to say there are limitations in the system because the system has to function and the basic part of the system to function is three basic things. People must read, uh, they must know how to write and calculate. And therefore, the investment in the foundation, let's put all the resources in that particular aspect. So I've taken through what we believe is a very important, sophisticated, complicated system that must move. And we're quite excited that we are moving. If you check the key barometer, which some people will ignore purely because it's doing well, the key barometer is the performance of our matriculants because that determines whether indeed we're going towards the right direction. When we came in in 2009, it was at 60%, 62%. We are standing at 75% performance. <laughs> so we have more learners that are accessing higher education, that are performing, that are going through our system. You check our ECD, which are our young ones, that perform very well. So where we are as a department of basic education, we believe resourcing is a very important thing, but it cannot be taken in isolation of the dictum that I've just indicated to you, which is the legislation in terms of constitution and policy, in terms of poverty eradication, which are social pressures, and international trends that we are part of and deal with these things. But we believe we have managed to deal with the limitations and the budget gaps. We've closed the apartheid gap, every learner now get the amount of money that they're supposed to get. We've managed to close key limitations that we have in society in terms of ensuring that there's movement of learners according to the system. We've managed to eradicate the wastages that we had. Remember, we had almost, almost 13 government, education government departments. Now we have a single government department in the country. So where we are as a department of education, we've covered ground, but more can still be covered. And we are hopeful that the debate and the discussion that are coming out of this particular session will assist us to enhance the things that we have to do, ensuring that quality education happens in our lifetime. I thank you. Thank you so much.